Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to Introduction to Psychology. Last lecture, we learned about emotion. Emotions are these primal instincts okay, that correspond to motivations. What's a motivation? Motivation is what makes you do something makes you engage in an intentional behavior. Okay, they are drives, they drive you. They are wants and needs that propel us in specific directions. What do I mean by direction? Like, where's the destination? Well, it's towards some kind of incentive. Since Motivation is about what people do. Psychologists are often looking to increase motivation because we want to make people do things. In, in the workplace, we're often looking to increase motivation in employees. Right? How do you ignite these drives in people so that they go do the things that, that you want them to do? And individuals themselves often look for ways to increase their motivation. There's a lot of self-help books on this kind of topic, a lot of seminars. Right? There are people who have careers in, as motivational speakers. According to your text, there's no good evidence that uh, these sort of motivational speakers have an effect. However, I haven't reviewed that evidence. And organizational psychology, organizational behavior is a field where there can be a lot of fads because many of the things that people do in business settings are never tested in an academic environment. That assumes that there's some business school professor or IO psychology professor that wants to go and and do that empirical research and there may be no interest in doing that there may you know there may be no funding for it there's there's a lot of silos in in the world and academia is, is its own kind of silo you've probably heard the term ivory tower and uh, businesses may operate without well they usually don't consult with academics on, on whether interventions are, say, effective. And so managers can be subject to a lot of fads. But if managers like some kind of a program or an intervention and, and they use it, they'll, they'll just do that. And if they think it works, then, then they'll keep using it. They're not really you know, accountable to, to the psychology professors on that. We have basic motivations that are essentially hardwired and you know, all animals share these basic motivations. They're, they're called the four Fs, a feeding or food motivated. We are also motivated to, to fight, to protect ourselves from threats or to go and claim resources. Fighting is, is related to a couple of other Fs, to, to, to feeding and, and fornicating, because uh, if you're able to successfully fight for some resource or territory, well, then maybe you get the food and, and the mates that are associated with that territory. And uh, I'm happy to see that, that Shirley likes uh, the F word that I kind of made up there, affiliating. And... That's because humans are social animals. Okay? We, we need other people. And so we have a motivation to, to please other people, to serve other people, to be in communion with other people, to be accepted, to be included, to belong. The pain of social exclusion is a very real one. It actually registers in the same part of the brain that registers physical pain. And 
Tylenol is actually effective at easing social pain. You can be in social pain because of, say, I don't know, a breakup or a layoff or, or being the subject of bullying and take a Tylenol and get some relief because it affects, it acts on the same part of your brain that, you know, that registers pain. Um, another instinct is, is fleeing. We have a motivation to be safe. Okay, so we have a motivation to run away from, from danger and to, to stop doing things that harm us. You'll remember from your learn readings on, um, on learning that we are likely, more likely to engage in behaviors, to repeat behaviors that lead to some kind of a reward. And we are less likely to engage in behaviors that somehow lead to some unpleasant outcome. That, that punish us. You can understand those in, in the context of these basic motivations. You know, common rewards are you know, food, sex, the approval of others, and you know, what, what do we avoid? Well, we avoid harm. So, Human behavior is, is very, very complicated, and human brains are very, very complicated and complex. And while we have not mapped the human brain and all its neurons and connections, we've done that with the fruit fly brain. And one researcher asked, well, you know, what, what do fruit flies spend their time doing? And that could be an interesting research project. Well, they, they spend their time feeding, right? They like hanging around bananas and compost bins. They fight. Here are uh, two, two males boxing each other. And often, what would they fight over? Mates, probably. They flee, okay? They, they run away from, from each other. And, um, they also fly in, in in groups. So I don't know, I don't know what, if they have friendships or, but there's some kind of social factor where fruit, fruit flies, within a, a cloud of fruit flies that are flying around, have little subclouds of, of fruit flies that seem to know each other. So maybe they hang out with other fruit flies that they like. And, and they spend most of their time fornicating. So you can see here, uh, they have the, the male has the leg display, and then there's elbow rubbing. And if that keeps if the female remains interested, um, apparently the females reject most advances, it would move on to uh, belly vibrating. And uh, if she's into that, then I guess they'd get it on. So a really simple animal like a fruit fly spends all its time answering to the, the four Fs. We are a more complex social species and we get up to more complex behaviors, but many of those behaviors ultimately represent these drives. So motivation drives behavior in a certain direction. Okay, but to what? To what end? To an incentive. An incentive is a positive, that means we want to go toward it, or negative, that means we want to go away from it. Environmental stimulus that the organism's behavior is directed towards. It's motivating the behavior. Okay? Incentives motivate behavior. And the incentive answers to those basic drives. Food is a positive environmental stimulus that corresponds to the F of feeding. And 
most animals, most of the time, are very, very interested in food. You know this if, if you have a dog. So for, for them, food is an incentive. But if you were to take an animal that was completely full, which probably doesn't happen that much in the wild, food wouldn't be an incentive anymore in that particular moment. Generally, it's an incentive for that animal. But in that particular moment when the animal's full and the drive is fulfilled, the food's not an incentive. Right? It doesn't have any motivational potential. And not all animals are motivated to consume all foods. Pineapple is not an incentive for cats. Right? In, in their opinion, that's not food. Meat is. An electric shock is an example of a negative environmental stimulus. And negative means we want to avoid it. We don't like it. So most animals don't like being subject to electric shocks. Maybe there's some masochist out there that likes electric shocks, but generally speaking, most animals don't like that. And they're motivated to run away. You could get them to do something like push a lever to stop the shock. But let's say that you had a particular individual animal that had no pain receptors. Maybe it was anesthetized, right? pumped full of morphine. Right? Then it wouldn't care. And in that particular situation or context, the electric shock wouldn't function as any incentive for behavior. One perspective on motivation is the one that I've just been coming from. It's an evolutionary perspective. Instinct theory holds that our biology, our genes, predispose certain species typical behaviors. Instincts are fixed, unlearned patterns. Consider the way a, a kitten behaves if, if you, well, pull anything in front of it, right? It, it wants to pounce on things. If you show a cat that's never seen a laser pointer before, uh, a laser beam and, and move it around on the floor, what's it going to do? It's going to run after it because it's a small moving thing. And cats are genetically predisposed to go and chase them and pounce on them. And you don't need to teach your cat that. You could take a little kitten away from its mother, hand raise it. That cat may have never seen aggression in its life. Like, you're not pouncing on things. It's not learning that from you. But show that had a laser pointer and it's going to go after that because that's its instinct. Here's another example of, of instinct. Um, certain birds will follow around the first thing that they see. Normally, the first thing that a baby duck or baby chick sees is its mother. And then the little ducks will follow around their mother. But psychologists have experimented with this, and if the first thing that the, the baby duck or the, the baby goose sees is the psychologist, then they'll follow that person around. That's uh, Conrad Lawrence, who is uh, a psychologist. And if the first thing they see is a red ball, then they'll follow the red ball. That's instinct. It's unlearned. And it's fixed. What do we mean by fixed? It's the same kind of behavior in, in all individuals. For these ducks or geese, it's following around the first thing they saw. Uh, for the cat, it's pouncing on things. And that pouncing behavior or following behavior is very consistent. So... Like emotions, motivations seem to be hardwired. Hardwired. 
And emotions represent motivations. Emotions are what a motivation feels like. And these motivations are different for different animals depending on their evolutionary history because different animals have evolved to survive and reproduce using different methods in different environments. So cats evolve to be solitary hunters in a particular territory. Say you get a kitten. And what does it spend all its time doing just for fun? It chases things and, and climbs things and pounces on things and generally engages with the world by attacking it. Right? The cat is a predator and those are all hunting instincts. They're just getting applied to your couch cushions and, and to your feet. A rabbit just isn't interested in doing those things. Okay, a, a rabbit would not be motivated to chase a laser pointer. That game doesn't work with a rabbit. Okay, it wouldn't care about the laser pointer, it wouldn't care about the string. It's just not motivated to engage with that stimulus because that stimulus has no incentive potential towards it or doesn't correspond to close, closely correspond to something that would have an incentive potential. So, you know, why should a, a, a beam of light be an incentive to a cat? I mean, it can't eat that, but it, it corresponds to something that it's programmed to, to chase after, which would be a, you know, a small, delicious little mouse. Dogs are also predators, but they evolve to hunt in packs that move across large territories and are staying together. So they're also predators, but they have a kind of a different strategy around getting their food. Okay, they, they hunt in, in social groups. Okay, dogs are social animals. And unlike cats, dogs really care about your approval and about what you want. And whether you're pleased with them or not. And, and they'll be loyal to you. There are stories about dogs who have traveled hundreds of miles to, to get to a family that, that moved and left them behind. Right? They'll go through all these trials in order to, to get back to, to the family. I think there was a movie about something like that once. Are there any stories like that about cats? Actually, you will find some. And, uh, and they seem very, uh, very inspiring. But there's, there's something different about those stories. In those cat, in those cases, the cat was given to another family that lived far away. And what the cat was doing is going back to its original territory. Okay, cats are bonded to territory. Okay, they generally won't follow you to a new territory on their own accord like a dog will. You have to put them in a carrier and, and take them and, and that really upsets them a lot. And, and humans and dogs who, who are social species will adopt and, and befriend other animals that aren't even in their species. And if you go somewhere, your dog comes with you because like home is wherever you are. And humans have adopted dogs and, and packs of dogs have adopted human children. It's not recommended, but it's one way that um, children have, have survived very difficult circumstances. Uh, I've never seen a cat be like, I will, I will love and, and cherish this sweet mouse. Okay, there's different instincts that corresponds to, to different evolutionary histories, different ways of surviving over, you know, millennia. Our instincts are 
experienced as drives. Okay, you have a drive to eat food. You get hungry. And you feel an, an inner need, an urgency to go and satisfy that drive. You go eat something and you feel better. Okay, you have this inner push, like feeling thirsty. There's some mechanisms in, in your body that, that tell you when you need to go and pursue that incentive that turn the drive on and off. Your body wants to be in a state of homeostasis. Okay? It wants you to be adequately hydrated, not dehydrated or in a state of water poisoning. That can happen if you drink too much water. Totally messes up your electrolytes. Okay. So if your body is out of balance in some way, you have a drive to go do something, to pursue some incentive that will function to restore that balance. Okay. If you're thirsty, you're motivated to go and find and, and drink water. And, and doing that will feel good. And then you feel satisfied. And the drive will go away until your body's out of balance again. Thorndike had to put, uh, Thorndike, sorry, studied operant conditioning. And Thorndike put cats in these puzzle boxes and timed how long it took them to, to figure out how to get out of the box. And then put the cat back in the box and measured that again. But in order to do that, he had to make the cat motivated to get out of the box. So he had to starve the cats, make them really hungry, and, and put you know fish on the other side. You can imagine that you couldn't do that experiment with a cat that wasn't hungry, right? It, it's in a box, so it would lick its butt and go to sleep. The experiment wouldn't work. So in order to do that experiment, in order to study the cat's ability to learn, Thorndike had to go and, and create that imbalance so that the cat had a drive to, to figure out the problem, right? And then he can study their, their problem-solving abilities. Arousal theory says that there is a right level of arousal for you. What you see there is um, the famous Yerkes-Dodson law, and it's a relationship between arousal and performance. And what it says is that you'll perform best, and other people maybe would say that you feel best when you're at an optimal level of arousal. There's a place where you could have too little arousal. You feel tired, sleepy, run down, and you're not going to perform very well if you feel that way. But then you could have too much arousal. You could be all amped up, all wired up. You're stressed and, and anxious. And then, then you don't do so well. A lot of students experience or struggle with something called test anxiety. They feel like emotionally overwhelmed by, by the exam that's in front of them. And even if they know the material, they're, they're too amped up to perform very well on that. Maybe you've experienced that before. How can you manage that? Well, a one textbook I read recommended taking a minute to just let yourself panic. 
get that over with and then move on. That's an idea. That's speculative. I don't know if that would actually help. You know, the, the textbook that, that recommended that didn't have a reference for it. Right? Like maybe if you pushed yourself into to panicking, you would just have a panic attack and, and ruin things for yourself. So I am I'm a little bit cautious about making that recommendation. Another recommendation I've seen is that you take out a piece of paper and just write down all your thoughts. And take 30 seconds, write down the panic thoughts that are running through your head. I'm gonna fail, I'm gonna have to drop out, I can never do anything right, and just get them out of your head by putting them on a piece of paper, putting that piece of paper away. Another strategy I've heard of is to take some deep breaths. People who are panicking tend to hyperventilate. Their breathing gets kind of rapid and shallow, and then that starts to mess with your oxygen levels and makes you feel even worse. And one way to get out of that is to breathe through a straw. I think another good way to manage test anxiety is to be prepared for your test. Have good study habits. We know that distributed practice is better than, than mass practice. So it is better to take your study time and spread it out in small chunks versus staying up all night to cram. And so if you have good study habits and you've given yourself time to do the readings, to listen to the lectures, to take notes, and to review your notes, you might go into a test feeling okay about it. Are there any strategies that, that you guys use? Is there anything that you'd like recommend to, to other students? Is this something that any of you guys have grappled with? I do get emails after a midterm from students saying that that's, that was an issue for them. Okay, um, Marcus says, I have a drop-in counselor who I can talk to. That's another really good resource that, that you can use. Often uh, universities have resources to support student success. And one of those resources is, is counseling. And both, like you'll find personal counseling centers and then career counseling centers. Since career applies to everything you do, career counselors can also help talk to you about this kind of thing. So that's a that's a, a little trick, right? Because sometimes there's a, a wait time to get um, to get into personal counseling, and so you can get get help faster if you also look for for career counseling. Right? They're also good counselors. Um, you can, as Marcus also suggests, like talking to to somebody that's knowledgeable about that kind of issue. You can talk to older students. You can talk to tutors about how to, to manage that. Um, in addition to counseling services, universities often provide academic support services. So I'm aware that there's that, that START program at Mount Allison where you get some, some coaching on academic skills. And uh, and, and another good thing is to have a, right, have a good positive attitude. What do I mean by positive? That word gets thrown around. Well, a test 
let's say you did fail a test, not the end of the world. Okay, that's not a catastrophe. It's a, it's a hassle. And you can learn from that experiences. All your experiences are resources and you want to apply all of your resources, including the ones that, that are less pleasant towards achieving your goal. And there's probably something that you can get out of that experience. There's probably a lot of information value in there. So when you get your test back and it wasn't, you know, you're not satisfied with the score, one of the first things you want to do is ask for a review session, right? go over it, see what questions you got wrong. And then you know what the gaps were and you realize what you missed. Or um, you might find out that there's, there was an error in the grading key. The instructor might realize that your way of answering that question was actually pretty decent and they might give you points back for it. As you guys uh, know, I've taken some, I've given credit for some matching question responses because you got some questions on the midterm that you shouldn't have gotten. They were pulled from, they were randomly pulled from a larger test bank. So when I was reviewing the midterm, I saw a set of 10 questions and I thought, hmm, um, these ones look okay, I'll change some. And then I was satisfied with the 10 that were left. Well, many of you didn't get those 10 questions, okay? Some of you did, but others got questions that did not correspond to anything you learned in lecture or read on the textbook, okay? Because they were based on another instructor, a test bank from another instructor, and you know, she added her own content to, to the lecture that I'm not adding to my lectures. Okay? And so sometimes there really are unfair questions. And if students hadn't asked to review their midterms, I wouldn't have known that, right? I would have assumed that everything was okay. So, so even if things go wrong, well, you know, you can do something to fix it. Maybe there's something you can do on your end and then there's something that other people can do on their end. So arousal theory, says that we're generally motivated to engage in behaviors that either increase or decrease our arousal levels in order to get to what feels like the right level of arousal. So let's say that you're all amped up, then you're probably gonna feel motivated to do things that will get you back down to the right level of arousal. When I'm stressed, I pace. And that pacing somehow calms me down. Another thing I like to do is, right, if I'm really stressed, is have a bath. That'll relax me. Maybe go to bed early, have a cup of tea, watch TV, do something to wind yourself back down. So I wonder, you know, is there anyone that would, would do things to, that are in the opposite direction that would serve to amp them up even more? I think sometimes we end up doing that, whether we intend to or not. I'm fairly high strung and I drink a lot of coffee. And what, what's that about? That's, that's not a good strategy. And so realizing that and how foolish it was, I, I switched to decaf. And yeah, I really did not need that, that caffeine in my life. Arousal theory, oh. And another thing I was thinking is sometimes when we're feeling uncomfortable for some social reason, like we're upset over, say, some conflict, some relationship issues, 
often we go and react or respond to that not in ways that make it better, but in ways that make it worse and make us even more upset. You know that if you've ever been involved in any kind of relationship drama. And, you know, maybe that's that's a skills issue. Maybe the ideal state is is peace and harmony. Maybe everyone really wants that. But we're not acting in ways that actually do that. Maybe we don't have the skills or the awareness. But the fact that we act in those ways sometimes kind of is, is in conflicts with this theory. Arousal theory would hold that low arousal levels motivate you to engage in activities that increase arousal, often through curiosity. Hey, let's go try this. There is a research study where the experimenters left their subjects, psychology undergraduate students like you, in a room, empty room, like this one, not very stimulating. And they had some devices that delivered electric shocks. I mean, there were already these electric shock pens, if I recall correctly. And the researchers observed the students' behavior. And what the students ended up doing was, was shocking themselves. Because they were bored. Incentive theories would tell you that an electric shock is a negative incentive. But we try not to get those. And to a very bored undergraduate, left alone in an empty room, that shock seemed to be a, a positive incentive because they were uncomfortably bored. And that observation supports arousal theory. There is evidence that introverts and extroverts differ in their levels of arousal. That introverts are chronically cognitively overstimulated. And so they're motivated to find more quiet settings away from people where they can recharge their batteries. And there is evidence that extroverts are chronically cognitively understimulated. So they need to go out looking for trouble. And they're more likely to do things like go bungee jumping or skydiving. They're more likely to go out and engage, including with other people. And other people can be, you know, there are a lot of stimulation. So a good introvert-extrovert question is, do you feel drained by being around other people? Or do you feel energized by being around other people? I'm an extrovert and, you know, left on my own with my work, I'd, I'd get sad pretty quickly. And I'd need to go out and find people and talk to them, go to some party, and then, then I feel energized and happy again. Jason feels drained. And so, Jason, I assume that maybe you have some, some hobbies, maybe quiet ones like you know, reading that, that you need in order to, to recharge your batteries. Keep in mind that there's a false dichotomy when, when we ask, you know, are you an introvert or an extrovert? Because really, extroversion is, is a normally distributed variable. And there's some people out on, on the high end, in the upper tail, who are true extroverts. And there's some people in the lower tail 
who are true introverts. And most people are actually in the middle of that distribution and they're ambiverts. So they're sort of not, not extroverts or introverts. Then you'll come across something called Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And this is the, the textbook publisher's slide pretty much as is. So this is in your textbook, just like that. And it suggests you have the lower level needs, physiological needs that you need to get met first before your safety needs and then your belonging needs. Then you have self-esteem needs. And finally, if you can reach those, then you are self-actualized, which means you've reached your full potential. This comes up in intro psych textbooks and in management textbooks. Um, the slide on that you're seeing now is from the other intro psych textbook that I teach from. It's popular and well known, and you know it has this general idea that you meet basic needs before you're interested in the higher level, more complex needs. And that's not without merit, right? That your physiological needs precede and have priority over more complex ones. It puts um, those physical, those physiological needs on the bottom, and there's something to be said for that. You know, there's research showing that students do better at school when they've had breakfast. There are breakfast programs that increase school achievement, and it uh, it then it says that once you've achieved those, then you can go and satisfy those those higher level more complex needs but it also has limitations right it's not evidence based really it's a theory people have gone and broken the rules people in concentration camps have given up their own food to save someone else i see um uh, michaela shared a YouTube, Maslow's Hierarchy in 12 Seconds. I'll, I'll check that out after class. The first one issue I have with this is, what do you mean by a need? What is a need? What does that word mean? I agree that food is a human need. Right? So is air and water and going to the toilet, having shelter from the elements. But, you know, I also see sex on this list of needs it is is sex a physiological need in the same way that air is a need jason says he doesn't need air just sleep i assure you that you need air so i would say that sex is is a drive and it can be a very very strong drive it can be a strong motivator and it's rewarding but it's not a need because you won't die without it and there's some people like people who are asexual who don't experience that need at all so we can be driven even strongly driven to things that we don't need right i see a lot of people engaging in achievement striving behaviors working very hard to achieve things that you know, they don't need, that might even be harmful in their lives, right? So, so what's, what's a, and then what's a psychological need? It's much more clear to me what a physiological need is. It's more clear to me that air is a physiological need, but what's a psychological need? Are there things that, that we all need psychologically as humans? I would agree that, that there are some, right? If you don't have any stimulation at all, if you're put into a sensory deprivation tank, you will hallucinate. You will get very anxious, lose your sense of time, and basically go mad. Right? That's why they do that to prisoners as, as a kind of punishment. People who are ex socially excluded also suffer right? a lot. That's, that's painful. And that's why solitary confinement is a form of punishment. So 
I'm willing to agree that stimulation and society are legitimate psychological needs. But what about those esteem needs? Right? What, what do they have there? Achievement, mastery, respect, confidence, competence. Are those are those needs? One way that we rationalize a sense of entitlement is by calling something a need, by asserting that it's a need, and that without it, our, our well-being will be critically harmed. So all of these, these things at first blush sound desirable, but you know, why must you pile up achievements? Why is well-being constant striving? That corresponds with certain theory of well-being. You might recognize that as eudaimonic. Okay, this Maslow's hierarchy of needs uh, assumes the, the eudaimonic theories of well-being, that, that you should be striving towards, uh, I don't know, fully manifesting yourself somehow reaching this pinnacle of, of self-actualization. Research in, in psychology actually suggests that pursuing esteem needs can be a pretty big problem. There are a lot of people that pursue accomplishments and they never, they never win. Right? They're always on to the next thing. They never feel satisfied. You're better off simply esteeming yourself right, as you are now. Not everyone wants to show up in the world sort of confidently you're in, in charge. Right? Some people prefer dependence and interdependence. And then you see self-actualization at the top, this idea of reaching your, your full potential. But what, is, what does that mean? That's kind of a, a mythical state. And, and what does it mean in a social context? Does it mean you have to have disproportionate access to resources to do it? Does it mean that everyone else is investing in your talents? You know, that, that other people are doing the drudge work while you pursue your passion. So getting to this mythical state of self-actualization assumes that you have complete latitude for self-determination. So Maslow's hierarchy of needs has taken on a, a life of its own in intro psych and management textbooks. And textbooks often present ideas differently than the original writings. And, you know, the original author of a theory might be really surprised to read what, what it says about it in a textbook. And that's because textbook authors are interpreters of a work who have a particular perspective. And often they aren't consulting the original writing. So when you look at your thick textbook that has all those references in it, do you think that the authors actually read all those primary sources? No. In many cases, they're citing secondary sources. Someone else said that this scientist said that thing. And then it can almost become like gossip. Right? Maybe they, they didn't consult the original writings. And they're reinterpreting an interpretation of the primary work. So look at me now. I'm criticizing what I read in textbooks about this theory. I'm criticizing what I'm reading about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And I haven't read the original works. And neither have you guys. Okay? And so criticisms of this pyramid aren't good criticisms of his original work. And what I do know from people who research this, I'm taking it on their word, is that the pyramid was never in his original works. It was somebody else many years later that came up with the pyramid. And so why are we doing this? What are we getting out of this conversation about Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Why do we keep teaching it? And one author said, well, you know, it's intuitively appealing. It kind of fits into a lecture on motivation. 
you know, it's easy to remember, makes good test questions, and it looks good on a PowerPoint slide. Okay. And these authors traced back the pyramid. They want to find where, where did this, this come from? And it was in an article by an IO psychologist about you know, how money motivates men. And there's some way to apply this to generate maximum motivation at the lowest cost. And you know what? I went and looked for that paper and I couldn't find it. So I haven't read it either. And so I don't really see the value of, of continuing to, to teach this pyramid. And yet we do when it comes up in, in every course that I teach. So back to drives. Certain drives lead us to approach something, whereas other drives lead us to avoid something. There are positive and negative incentives. Approach, approach avoidance, sorry, approach avoidance conflict happens when an individual is faced with a decision to pursue or avoid something at the same time because the thing has advantages and disadvantages. There are pros and cons to pursuing this thing. And that conflict causes stress because you're going back and forth and trying to make a decision on what should you do, right? There's like a push and a pull towards this stimulus, right? Should you go to grad school? Right? Should you get married? So in an approach avoidance conflict, you have one thing, maybe it's not a thing, you have a decision to make, you have a, there's a situation that you're going to approach or avoid, and it contains both positive and negative incentives. In an approach, approach conflict, you have to choose between two things you want, right? There's two good things, but you can only have one of them. Will you date Steve or will you date Tom? Can't have both. In an avoidance, avoidance conflict, you have to choose between two things you don't want. Like you have to decide which one's worse. Will you keep the job that you hate or lose your income? Sometimes people like to choose the devil they know and they stay at the job. In a double approach avoidance conflict, you're confronted with two options that each have significant attractive and unattractive features, okay? This is the double version of the approach avoidance conflict that we started off with, okay? So these two options each have significant attractive and unattractive features. They both have positive and negative incentives. Okay, so maybe you're choosing between two potential jobs and there's pros and cons to each. And that's a pretty common situation. Incentive theories propose that we are motivated by goals. And you could ask, you know, what are these goals? You have a goal to finish this course with a good grade. But what basic drive does that correspond to? Maybe there's an intrinsic motivation. Maybe you just want to learn about psychology because you like psychology. You want to do psychology. That's intrinsic motivation. And actually, students that have mastery goals, students who have a goal to master the material in the course, tend to get better grades than students who are more explicitly grade motivated. Extrinsic motivation 
refers to goals that you have for some reason that's extrinsic to, that's outside of the activity itself. Maybe you're taking this class because you think that at getting a degree will help you get some job. Maybe you'll never do use what you learn in this class in that job. But you just need to get the credit to get the degree, to get the job, which will pay you money. Okay, that's extrinsic motivation. And I think we can combine intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. I'm intrinsically motivated to teach, but I'm also extrinsically motivated to, to teach as a job. It is possible to undermine intrinsic motivation by providing rewards. So if you pay somebody to do something, if you pay Johnny to play the piano or you pay me to teach, then I could get, or Johnny could get, less intrinsically motivated to pursue that activity. Because now it's not about the activity itself, now it's about getting the, the treat or the paycheck. And I know some people who say that they don't want their hobbies to be their job. Right? There may be somebody that loves music, but they would never want music to be their job because that would change their relationship to the activity. In psychology, it's common to knock extrinsic motivation as if, you know, you should only be intrinsically motivated. You might have heard about locus of control. The idea is that you should have an internal locus of control where you're all kind of self-driven and self-referencing and not uh, kind of responding to external contingencies. And I kind of question that because mainstream psychology puts, you know, it has its values. and puts a strong value on self-determination, on autonomy and independence. And those are some people's values, and they're very much the values of Western cultures, but that's not everyone's values, and that's not what every culture values. In Asian cultures, a strong value is placed on what your family thinks. And so maybe what you do is more about what your family needs or expects than, you know, what you would do if you were independent from them. So that refers to extrinsic motivation, but is it bad? I don't know. There's a cultural value judgment there. And uh, in fact, something that career counseling scholars have observed is that Western career counseling models don't work so well for Asian students because they have different motivations. Maybe it's about, you know, what they do is about what their family expects. There's nothing really wrong with that. It's just a different way of doing things. But what I do want to, to point out is that the way we think about intrinsic and extrinsic motivation reflects Western cultural values in, in psychology. Thank you for your time and I'll wrap up the lecture there. We'll see you on Monday.